Today, we will be highlighting the significant contribution of Lina Bobadri to Brazilian modernism and modernism at large through her construction of everyday life. And as we will see, people had roles to play in her architecture, as if the spaces she designed were an invitation for their participation. Building and being were a collective effort, a collective doing, a duty, a responsibility in a technical and scientific practice that could not be done in isolation of the socio-political, cultural and economic systems, processes and structure. Achelina Enrique Bo was born in a working class neighborhood in Rome in 1914. Her father Enrique Bo was an engineer and an accomplished painter of urban scenes, which influenced her love of drawing. Most of Lina's life in Italy occurred under the regime of Benito Mussolini. The role of modern architecture in Italy is directly tied to the fascist regime. Mussolini's regime rejected the avant-garde and sponsored buildings that evoked neoclassical forms, referring back to Rome's formal glory. And shortly after marrying Pietro Maria Bardi, Lina goes with him to Brazil on what was supposed to be a temporary work trip. Arriving in the port of Rio de Janeiro, the couple carried a small number of paintings to be exhibited in the famous Ministry of Education and Health building. And when she saw the building, Lina was in awe. This renewed sense of possibility and rebirth can be further seen through her description of the movement, which she said, that didn't have time much to stop and think. It was born suddenly like a beautiful child. We see her fascination with everyday life in Brazil through this urban sketch of street life, especially in this public space, which she likened to public platforms and exhibition galleries that require the moral duty and a collective responsibility. The couple stayed permanently in Brazil when Pietro was asked to direct and create the Museum of Modern Art of Sao Paulo. The museum was raised up on a volume, as we can see here, which allowed for the creation of open public space underneath. This opportunity for moments of everyday life under what she calls the, uh, an evening shadow was meaningful to Lina, evident through her drawings where she imagined its everyday use. Under Pietro and Lina at Maspi, the museum showed a true commitment to everyday life through its sponsorship and exhibitions highlighting popular art and culture, which embrace daily life and art outside of the high art and Western epistemes. Lina's goal of creating a more democratic museum visiting experience was spatially realized when she put paintings of different cultures, time periods, and art styles onto these glass easels, which are supported by these concrete blocks. This is a statement of desacralization and a direct resistance to the Western canonical tradition of elevating only European high art while primitivizing other countries' art merely as handicrafts or folk art. This allowed visitors to move around different paintings freely, rendering the paintings closer to the viewers and freeing the paintings from the traditional spatial hierarchies. Lena continued to show her commitment toward everyday life when she arrived in the Northeast of Bahia. A not so well-known project she did was in Mercy Slope, where she, com where she was commissioned to restore the historic center after it was declared a UNESCO site in 1985. Between the 60th and 19th century, this historical center was the route to carry cargo on the backs of enslaved African people. This historical and cultural context informed Lena's work and her evolution as an architect and her affinity towards the, what she refers to as popular art. Her work in Mercy Slope was made up of four abandoned buildings that were to be converted to social housing. Lina was a major proponent of public housing in Brazil, which she referred to as a right, not a gift, that the government must confront with serious planning instead of defaulting to iron fists, military policing, and brutality. Another work done by her was this Coti restaurant, which opened in 1987 and served Afro-Brazilian cuisine and was frequented by Bahian intellectuals. It featured a concrete structure that spiraled around an existing mango tree. Her commitment to everyday life, thereby the community residence, was shown when she dropped out of this project in 1989 because the project coordinators wanted to do a tabula rasa approach and displace the city center's residents. She was adamant in keeping the city's everyday life amid the growing socioeconomic inequities and the military's continued suppression of popular culture. She did not want this historical center to turn into Uma Vistilandia, or a tourist zone that was out of the context of everyday life and used local residents merely as props for tourism. Unfortunately, hundreds of the residents were displaced and formed one of the country's largest favelas in the outskirts of the city. 
Now with the last project, Lena saw the potential of continuing the already existing urban life of the previously known Pompeia Drumworks. Upon her initial visit, she saw the scenes unfold before her, a woman barbecuing, children playing soccer, and people doing puppet theater. She saw the potential of a leisure center that required no demolition, which was the original plan. She claims that she did not want to transform the structure, rather her work aimed only to add more to the already existing vibrant community. Her major additions were these three concrete towers. One was the water tank. One block was for playing courts and pools made of these pre-stressed concrete with punched out windows. And she painted the windows red to make the concrete less intimidating. The middle are composed of aerial walkways that connected the two blocks and the other block are for changing rooms. She only tore down the partition walls to allow for a large open space to serve the different uses of the already vibrant community of all ages. The result of the interior of Ses Pompeia was a total Gaston Kunst work. She even designed the furniture and the worker uniforms. Her sketches, like the ones in the top here with a snack bar, shows the influence of theater and set design and her creation of new conditions for leisure. Her famous chair embodies her aim for urban life and a touch of theatricality against staticness. There are also vast open spaces that became reading rooms, classrooms, theaters, plays, exhibition areas. And true to her commitment to building everyday life, she dedicates Sess to the people and the community as their space for studying, leisure, doing sports, partying, dancing, or just meeting. It's a place that allows both for duality and contradictions, work and play of individual and social coexistence. And at 72 years old, this project became the high point of her career as it combined architecture, theater, visual communication, and exhibition design. This space, as you can see from these three pictures, is still well loved and well inhabited today. Now, while she remained firmly self-identified as a modernist, unlike her modernist contemporary, she was against the fundamental and modernist notion of universalization, bringing her elevation of popular art closer to the values and work of vernacular architects and critical regionalists. However, as we highlight her great contributions to the modern period and modern architecture at large in this lecture, we have to remember that she is an architect that truly cannot be and refuses to be reduced to a single approach, style, or movement. Lena is a polymath pushing out of canonical boundaries in architecture movements. She also differed from her modernist contemporaries by embracing that architecture was also about poetry, never about a single beauty projected by a pure formalistic image of the building. Architecture was supposed to be live and must invite residents to participate into what she calls an urban drama, a stage for everyday life where she declares human beings as the protagonists of these spaces. Thank you.